Okay, we moved up to the loft of our family center and I'd like to, for the next moments, continue that theme of the Tyndale tradition. Going back to the 1526 Tyndale New Testament from the Greek text into the English language. And that led, we saw in the last video, to Miles Coverdale's Coverdale Bible in 1535. I said that John Rogers produced in 1537 his Thomas Matthew Bible, used a, a pseudonym or a, a fake name to protect his identity. That in turn led to the Great Bible in 1539. And that's kind of where we left off last time. But I purposely skipped over John Rogers because I want to go back to that and focus on his life for a few minutes. <clears throat> this Bible is 1537, and you see that it's the Matthews Bible. Uh, William Tyndale, Miles Coverdale, John Rogers. All their names are put on the back because basically it's a Tyndale Bible. John Rogers was Tyndale's friend. He also was a great scholar and translator. And he's a survivor, at least into the 1550s. And he carries forward the uh, work of Tyndale, first of all, through this work. If you were to look into the the title page will show it to you up close later. <clears throat> There's some interesting words in it. You have in the picture uh, a poor soul that's at the bottom and two men are preaching to him. And one is aiming back to Jesus on the cross. He's trying to lead him to Christ. And they're all kind of biblical images there. But running across in bright red lettering at the bottom of the page, it says, set forth with the king's most gracious license. It's spelled different from the way we would do today. But it is a licensed Bible. The great Bible will come out two years later, but this has some kind of license from the king of England. And so that's a big step forward. There's a growing freedom to translate the Bible and publish it to the English-speaking world. So that's a big step. John Rogers... Uh, emerges in the 1540s and into the 1550s as a major leader. With the Tyndale gone, he is uh, treated with great respect. He preaches at a church in London, old London, that's called St. Sepulchre Without Newgate. There's a name for a church. Where do they get a name like that? St. Sepulchre is named for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the church that's built over the site of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, burial and resurrection. And so the church there in London was named for that, but they added to the name without Newgate, which meant just outside the Newgate or the northern gate to the old wall of the city of, Jeruz uh, city of London. John Rogers' church is there, and he preaches there for a number of years. We'll study his life in more detail. And his work done secretly in 1537 is redone in a larger volume, more like this Bible, but a larger volume uh, in 1549. Now, this is an actual page from uh, a Rogers work. This is the Thomas Matthew Bible from 1549, Jeremiah chapter 9. So you see this is larger and more intended for pulpit use. Or it's a bigger Bible, but there's also a greater freedom by 1549 to share the word. There's a picture here on our table in the middle, and the boy on the throne is Edward VI, the boy king, the British Josiah. He's the son of Henry VIII. He has been raised after his father's death by evangelical scholars and clergy. He's a, a bright individual, and he's totally committed to the Bible and to Reformation theology. And this picture is drawn of him at St. Paul's Cathedral, and it's sort of stylized depiction of him on a little ledge on the side of the cathedral, and the pulpit over here on the side is St. Paul's Cross. It's an outdoor pulpit, and you could preach out there, and mobs of people might gather around to listen to the preacher. In this particular picture, that's Hugh Latimer, the voice of the English Reformation you'll study about 
and your course in Zambia. But Latimer's preaching there to Edward. That might just as well be John Rogers preaching to Edward or to a crowd at St. Paul's Cross. The cathedral and Paul's Cross is about three blocks from John Rogers Church. You will, Lord willing, go to that church and to that cathedral and see all these locations. John Rogers goes, this uh, remarkable scholar slash pastor uh, slash theologian uh, goes almost daily down to St. Paul's Cathedral and preaches either in the cathedral or in that outdoor pulpit uh, to large gatherings of people. It's an amazing time of freedom for Bible scholarship, for Bible proclamation, for the expansion of the Reformation. Edward is king. He is king at age nine and dies at 15. But for six years, there's this season of opportunity. And men like John Rogers are all about preaching in that season and making every day count for preaching the gospel at St. Paul's Cathedral and in downtown London. So uh, we're progressing along the line of these Bibles. And John Rogers has produced this in 1537 and redone it in 1549 in these years of great freedom. He's improved it, made it a bigger work, uh, added some more artwork to it, and it's being published as a major work of the English-speaking world. Now, Edward dies in 1553, and he is replaced by his half-sister, Mary. Mary I of England. She is the oldest child of Henry VIII. And she is a militant Catholic, and she's on a mission to reverse, completely reverse the Protestant Reformation. She's on a mission to end forever Bible translation into the English language. She wants to be submissive to Rome and to the Latin Bible and not have the Bible in the language of the people. And so there's a reversal that goes on for about five years in the mid-1550s. During that time frame, uh, Mary begins to kill off some of the great martyrs of the church, some of the great translators and preachers and church leaders of the Protestant Reformation in England. And the first to die in that time is John Rogers, who's produced this Bible. Uh, he is a, a great hero of the church, but he is the first martyr of Bloody Mary. And uh, so that's the John Rogers Thomas Matthew Bible. 1537 and 1549. During the years of Mary I, Bloody Mary, as she's called, uh, there is a, a fleeing of scholars and church leaders in England. Uh, they go across the water into Europe. Geneva, Switzerland is where John Calvin is working and preaching and systematizing theology for the church, a great leader of the Protestant Reformation. And these English scholars flee to Geneva as a safe haven. Miles Coverdale, we talked about earlier, uh, went there. John Knox of Scotland went there. Uh, and they find a, a safe area to pastor English-speaking people and to translate. And they will give us the next great English Bible, the Geneva Bible. This New Testament came out in 1557. It is obviously intended to be a personal work that could be taken anywhere and read. Uh, 1537, the first edition comes out and it has many, many, many notes. It's like a modern day study Bible. If you've got an ESV or an NIV study Bible, it would be like that. It really uh, gets things headed in that direction for future Bibles. That comes out while these men are living in Geneva while the persecution of the evangelical church is going on in England. Uh, so, uh, man, William Whittingham is behind that work. He's the primary leader. He's married to the sister of John Calvin's wife. So they're sort of brother-in-laws, this great reformer. And Whittingham, who's come there from England, they end up by marriage related to each other. And a number of famous people work with Whittingham to produce the Geneva New Testament. 
and eventually in 1560, the Geneva Bible. And you'll be able to look at some of these up close. The, the pages, many of the pages, are loaded uh, with uh, complex theological notes that are very definitely of the Protestant Reformation. There's a title page to the New Testament, and you can get a close-up of this later. Uh, and it's a depiction of Moses leading Israel through, it's called here the, Reeds, the Red Sea, or we would say the Sea of Reeds. Uh, and they're boxed in there, but they will go uh, through the water, as Exodus describes it, and uh, the Geneva Bible people have put around the picture various things that you can see in a, a still shot of that, uh, talking about staying strong in their faith and trusting that God would deliver. Well, God did deliver, and in 1558, uh, Mary died, and her half-sister Elizabeth would become the Queen of England. That shifted gears to a season of great peace, and prosperity and freedom, religious freedom. And so the reformers were able, people like Miles Coverdale could come back to London and resume their work and pastor their churches and uh, preach the gospel, uh, spread the, the scriptures. Uh, so that happens uh, and the 1560 Geneva Bible becomes the dominant major Bible of the Bible-believing evangelical, gospel-believing, Church of England. When the gospel came to America in 1507 at Jamestown, Virginia, and in 1520 in New England, uh, they came over on the Mayflower. This was their Bible, the Geneva Bible, not the King James Bible. When Gen the, the Jamestown colony was established, there was no King James Bible yet. They brought the Geneva Bible with them. But a few years later, when the Mayflower came, it was nine years after the King James Bible, but they brought the Geneva Bible, and this outsold the King James for many years. They treasured it because it was a, basically a Tyndale Bible, but it had been improved and had all these notes that encouraged them in their biblical studies. It's what their pastors wanted uh, for study and for preaching from, and so that's the Geneva Bible. Now, continuing on, the next Bible that will come along in the Tyndale tradition is called the Bishop's Bible. Now, let me give you the background story to how that emerges. If you went back to the 1530s, Henry VIII's second wife was Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn had a Tyndale New Testament and read Luther's books. She's accused of all kinds of uh, bad behavior and we'll never know the truth because they were looking for things to accuse of her of. But she did read the Tyndale New Testament. She had a personal chaplain. A queen of England in those days would have their own personal pastor or chaplain. And hers was a man by the name of Matthew Parker. We'll get you a picture of Matthew Parker. Uh, but Parker, to the queen, down to the time when she's beheaded at the Tower of London. If you make it to London, you'll see that very sight. Uh, and you'll see it in movies sometimes, a depiction of the execution of Anne Boleyn. But before Anne died, her, her chief offense is that she fails to produce a male heir, a, a future king to replace Henry VIII. But she does have a daughter, and her daughter is extremely important. Her daughter is Elizabeth, and someday she would become Elizabeth I, the Queen of England, and rule for a very long period of time. But while Anne is under sentence of death and Elizabeth is still quite young, Anne calls her chaplain, Matthew Parker, in and says, I entrust to you the well-being of my child. Elizabeth, little Elizabeth, is in your watch care. You're going to be her godfather. You're going to see to her physical safety and her spiritual safety. I trust you. I trust you only. You take care of Elizabeth. That's in the 1530s. Well, Matthew Parker took that quite seriously, and Elizabeth was raised with great opportunity to learn. Uh, she did not expect to become the Queen of England, though she did. And in 1558, she actually becomes Elizabeth I of England and rules for over 40 years. Elizabeth looks back 
to her special relationship with Matthew Parker, this godfather of hers. And she needs a bishop for the Church of England. And the Queen of England, the King of England, would appoint the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the head of the English church. And so Queen Elizabeth, young, single Queen Elizabeth, appoints her older friend, Matthew Parker, to be the Archbishop of Canterbury and the, the leader of the English church. Her half-brother, Edward, that we'll study about in class, was a full-fledged evangelical Protestant. Her half-brother by another mother, Mary, was a full-fledged Roman Catholic. Elizabeth doesn't really want to be either one of those. She wants to be right down the middle and have a church that all English people could embrace and see as their church. And so she guides the, the Anglican church right down the middle with the help of her mentor godfather, Matthew Parker. Matthew Parker thinks, and Elizabeth thinks, that what they really need is a new Bible with no notes in it, uh, that's just a pure translation of the scripture in the Tyndale tradition, but without those Reformation notes that came out of the Geneva Bible. And so uh, Matthew Parker, with other bishops, produces what's known as the Bishop's Bible. And this is a, a copy, not, this is not an original, this is a reproduction of it. It's about a 30 pound book. It's a whale of a book. It's huge, obviously intended to be a pulpit Bible. Uh, and it looks like that. You see woodcuts like that running through it. It's a very involved, uh, beautifully produced book in 1568. It's a masterpiece. It does not sell like the Geneva Bible. And the hardcore evangelicals that most Baptists or evangelicals in Zambia or America today would relate to did not transfer their loyalty to the Bishop's Bible. They stayed true to the Geneva Bible. That was their Bible uh, that they preferred. Uh, and the Bishop's Bible never took off like it was intended to, but it was a masterpiece of production. We have here a few pages from it. These pages are originals from the Bishop's Bible. This is from 1568, and uh, you can see the quality of the printing, the, the typesetting, the readability of it. It was a great, great work. It's still almost identical to the original work of William Tyndale. Now, years later, when the King James will be done in the early years of the next century, and committees were formed to do that work, their starting point was to take apart a bishop's Bible and divide it up into six parts, pages just like this, outside of bindings, and assign them to committees. And so for the King James Bible, they said, your job is to just make marks on the margin of how you would change this. Stay as close to this as you can and still accomplish our goals, but this is our starting point. The Bishop's Bible will be the foundation for the King James Bible. And they stayed very close to that, very little variation to it. The King James translators would just polish the language a bit, uh, but very little difference or transition from the Bishop's Bible to the King James Bible 40-something years later. This is the quarto edition, uh, edition of the Bishop's Bible, and you see the pages are smaller. This is more intended. This is a year after the 1568. This is 1569. This is an original from that year, uh, and you see it's, uh, you take the same size page as these, and you divide it four ways, and you come up with a page that size. So the printer could stack more pages into the press as he's printing, and you come up with personal size. So it's very tight, uh, much like some of our Bibles today. Uh, so that's the Bishop's Bible, and it was the next great step along the line. So with the Tyndale tradition, just to tie it up and summarize, we've gone from the 1526 first edition that Tyndale himself did, his Old Testament scripture translation in the early 1530s, his second edition of the New Testament in 1534, Miles Coverdale's Bible in 1535, John Rogers' Thomas Matthew Bible in 1537, licensed, the gracious license of the king with it, and then in 1539, the first authorized translation 
of the Bible in English, the Great Bible or the Chain Bible or the Cranmer Bible are different names that it's given. Rogers reworks his work in the good years of Edward. And so in 1549, we have an improved John Rogers, Thomas Matthew Bible. Mary comes to the throne, and in 1557, while that persecution is going on, we have the Geneva New Testament, followed three years later by the Geneva Bible that would endure for over half a century as the major Bible of the evangelical world. And competing with that, its sales was the Bishop Bible of 1568. Now the next step will be the King James Bible of 1611. But we'll stop at this point in this video with the Bishop's Bible.